Father Wild, distinguished trustees and alumni, learned faculty, fellow Bonnerees, members of the great graduating class of 2011, parents, ladies, and gentlemen. I am extremely grateful and honored to take part in this celebrate occasion. We have, alas, little ceremony left in our way of life, but commencements exercises continue and thrive. And what wonderful, worthy gatherings. Here we are, from every part of our country and much of the world. We are of different backgrounds and different vocations and all ages. And the reason we gather is to celebrate true accomplishment of the most far-reaching importance. Commencements, a tradition dating back to the Middle Ages, remain a great present-day moment of fulfillment, of dreams to come and dreams come true for both graduates and the many others, parents, faculty, generous, devoted alumni who have done so much to make such an education possible. I wish you all warmest congratulations. Among the treasures in the Boston Public Library is a small leather-bound book that belonged to John Adams. It is Cicero's Orations in Latin, and the first book Adams ever owned. Whether it was a gift or, paid, or for, he paid for it himself is unknown. But he was 14 years old, and he was so proud of his new possession that he wrote his name in it six times. Adams read voraciously all of his long life, history, biography, philosophy, Shakespeare, the Bible, many times over. Riding the court circuit as a young attorney, he carried Don Quixote in his saddlebag. Buying books was his only extravagance. I want to see my wife and children every day, he would write while on the road. I want to see my grass and blossoms and corn. But above all, except for the wife and children, I want to see my books. Carry a book with you always, he advised his son, John Quincy. You'll never be alone with a poet in your pocket. My heartfelt message for you of the class of 2011 this day is to keep on reading. I have a good idea of how much you have already read, but it's only a beginning. If your experience is anything like my own, the most important books in your lives are still to come. <coughs> At the time of my college graduation, I received as a present from one of my aunts a copy of Bruce Catton's The Stillness at Appomattox. It started me reading about the Civil War. I'd been an English major. One Civil War book led to another, then more, then on to more on American history overall, which started me down the trail that became my life's work. Among the greatest most long-lasting rewards of that work has been the constant quantity and variety of reading required. Read all you can. Read to keep pace with your work, or if you'd prefer, read to get away from your work. Read for ideas. Read for a better understanding of the human condition. Read to find out. Read for variety, read for pleasure. By all means, read for pleasure. Read, read, read. Read history, knowing history and so much that those before us endured and achieved helps us all measure up as citizens and as human beings. History is a source of strength and inspiration and an aid to navigation in dangerous times such as these. 
Get yourself a guide to the thousand or more classics published in those beautiful, durable penguin paperbacks and start your own collection, if you haven't already, of classics. And yes, try a little of Cicero if you haven't already. <clears throat> Read the autobiographies and published letters of exceptional men and women. I love especially the letters, the letters of Flannery O'Connor. Open the book and begin at almost any page and you will see what I mean. We are what we read more than we realize. And notable readers are most notably leaders. It is not coincidental that our most admirable American presidents have been, like John Adams, avid readers. Jefferson, Lincoln, the two Roosevelts, Harry Truman, all lifelong readers. I cannot live without books, Jefferson told Adams. Theodore Roosevelt could read a book in an evening, speed reading, before speed reading had been invented. And he could quote from what he had read years afterward. In all fields, readers, the leaders are readers, in all fields. In my whole life, I have, not, I have known no wise people who didn't read all the time, none, zero, unquote. That was not said by a Cicero or a Roosevelt, but by Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's partner at Berkshire Hathaway. We have in our time greater choice in what we read than ever in history, more than any civilization past could have even imagined. A browser in the average Barnes & Noble bookstore has something on the order of 150,000 different titles choose from. Think of it. On the website, fully a million titles are available. And of course, if the cost of buying books is too much, we have access to our miraculous American public library system, whereby books in infinite quantity are available for free. One of my favorite authors and one of the finest men I have ever known was the late Paul Horgan, the author of brilliant fiction and nonfiction. If you've not read him, I suggest beginning with his biography of Bishop Lamy of Santa Fe. Paul never went to college, but he was a university unto himself because of all that he read. What are you reading? He loved to say as, way, as a way of greeting. Just now, I'm reading a second time a highly engaging book called The Lives of a Cell by the medical researcher Lewis Thomas, along with a murder mystery set in Venice, A Sea of Troubles by Donna Leon, and a remarkable autobiography called The Hair with Amber Eyes. The author is Edward Duvall, and I can hardly put it down. For your own future reading list, may I also recommend a few of my old favorites. Goethe's Italian Journal, one of the best travel books ever, and almost anything by Anthony Trollope, but especially The Way We Live Now. First published in more than a century ago, it seems in our time, as a view of our time, as if it were written yesterday. So on you go, you of the class of 2011. Heed the call of your dreams if possible, but do not expect dreams to be all it takes. What is your capacity to work as you never have, with little or no recognition, or much in the way of financial recompense for an extended period of time? It takes hard work and time, make no mistake. But if it is work you love, Therein, believe me, is the real reward. Though the commercial pro pro propaganda would have us believe otherwise, happiness and ease are not necessarily synonymous. In the fall of 2007, as you were entering your freshman year at Marquette, I embarked on a new project. And as a result of your four-year efforts, 
is the degree you receive today, so the result of my efforts is a book to be published the day after tomorrow. It is called The Greater Journey, and it is about a number of gifted young Americans of the 19th century, men and women of your age, who, ambitious to excel in their chosen work, set off for Paris for the further training and education they knew they must have in art, architecture, and medicine. All would work harder in Paris than they ever had, and virtually all would later count it as the happiest time of their lives. My advice is don't worry about success or money. Choose work you love, work that makes you want to get up out of bed in the morning. Work you love is not always possible right away, and finding it can take time. Choose wisely. What you do, to a very large degree, is what you become as a person. Take time to think. I'm often asked, and a perfectly good question it is, how much of my time I spend doing research and how much writing. I don't recall ever being asked how much of my time I spend thinking, and that's often the most important part. Make time to think every day. I find an early morning walk will work a lot in that respect. Don't sit life out on the sidelines. Take part. Make something new. Go places. And yes, take a book along. And sometime, at some point, do something for your country.